Hey everyone, it's Brandon, and this is a very basic overview and beginner tutorial for sculpting in Blender. We will touch on setting up a base mesh for sculpting, the Blender sculpting interface, some of the sculpting brushes, masking, and a little about using a drawing tablet to sculpt. Again, this is a very basic beginner tutorial, so let's get started. First, we can't talk about sculpting without mentioning drawing or graphic tablets. Sculpting with a mouse just isn't efficient for two reasons. One, it's not as intuitive of a hand motion. We are all used to using pins and sculpting with a mouse just isn't natural. And two, for detailed sculpting, we need pressure sensitivity, which we don't get with a mouse. A mouse is either clicked on or not clicked, but graphics tablets are pressure sensitive. They can be set up so that the harder we press on the pin, the stronger the effect from the sculpting brush. Trust me, you're gonna want a drawing tablet, but you don't need to get very fancy with this. I'll link to two in the description that can be found on Amazon. So with that out of the way, let's talk about base meshes for sculpting in Blender. To sculpt an object or character, we're going to need some sort of geometry to start with. Here are some ways we can do that. One, we can start with a primitive, like a sphere, or we can block out some very basic geometry in edit mode. Two, we can use metaballs. Metaballs are a type of object in Blender that kind of stick together. You add different metaballs and they connect to form a base shape. Then we convert the metaballs to a mesh and we can start sculpting. For character sculpting, we can import a base character mesh. These are available in a lot of places. There are several free ones in Blender format at CG Trader. I'll throw my referral link in the description, but there are definitely a lot of free ones. These allow us to start with an anatomically correct human and modify it with sculpting. And four, one last way is to use the skin modifier. The skin modifier added to a mesh creates an adjustable skin around the edges of a mesh that can be made into a basic shape to start out with. Look for a tutorial on the skin modifier if you want to go this route. It's good for non-human or unique base shapes. You'll need to apply the skin modifier before you start. But the point is, we need something in the general shape of what we want to start with. So however we get a base shape, we then can begin sculpting. Blender has a default sculpting workspace found right up here. The sculpting workspace will give us all the tools we need to sculpt in Blender. On the top of the sculpting workspace, we have general options for sculpting. We will cover several of these settings. On the left, we have a very long list of sculpting brushes to choose from. We're going to cover a lot of those, too. Some are very similar to each other, and some have very specific uses. To get started, there's only a few sculpting brushes we really need to understand. On the right, we have a Properties panel with Tool Properties selected. This will show us specific tool settings for whichever sculpting brush we have selected. So let's cover some basics of sculpting in Blender by discussing the settings visible on the top of the screen. The default selected brush is the top brush right here, called the draw brush. The settings I'm about to cover will apply only for whichever brush we currently have selected. On the far left is the name of the brush. Later we can create custom versions of this brush and browse for them here. Next we have the brush radius, that's the size of the brush, and this is measured in pixels. With the default settings I want to point something out. If we are really zoomed into a mesh and we start sculpting something, notice how big the brush is compared to the size of the mesh. If we zoom out further and sculpt, notice the brush is much larger than it was before when compared to the mesh. That might be what we want, it might not, depending on what we're trying to do. So I'll jump ahead just a little, and over to the right we have a drop-down box labeled Brush. At the very top we see a setting labeled Radius Unit, and there are two options. View is selected. This means the radius units entered in the brush size are dependent on the view in the 3D viewport. That's why the brush size is changing when we zoom in and out. If we instead choose the option for Scene, our sculpting brush will remain a fixed size regardless of how much we zoom in or zoom out. Again, there are uses for both settings, but I more often find that I want the Scene Radius selected, so I'll leave it on that. The strength of the brush is how strong the brush's effect will be, and this is measured on a scale from 0 to 1. 1 will be full strength, and at 0, the brush will not do anything. We normally want it somewhere in the middle, and it defaults to half strength. Next to both the radius and the strength settings, you may have noticed this little icon. This is the pressure sensitivity setting, which can be turned on or turned off. This is where the pressure sensitivity from the drawing tablet becomes important. Whenever we see this icon next to a setting in Blender, having it turned on will mean that the pressure sensitivity input from our tablet will be affecting this setting. If it's off, then it will be a binary on or off setting, as if we were clicking with a mouse. And this setting is only useful at all if we have a pressure sensitive pin tablet. We can choose to have the pressure sensitivity affect the radius, the strength, or both. Most often, the default setting of having it turned on for the strength and off for the radius is what we want. 
And if you're still watching, I would love you to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. It helps me out a lot. Thank you so much. Next, we see a plus and minus sign, and here the plus is highlighted. This is where we tell Blender whether we want our brush to have a positive or negative effect on the mesh. This means that if it's positive and we sculpt with the brush, the mesh will sculpt outwards, as if we were adding clay to our sculpture. If it's negative, the brush will push inward toward the mesh. This is all based on the normal direction of the mesh, which in short just means that if we aren't getting the proper effect, like if we have it on positive but it's sculpting into the mesh, it's probably because our normals need to be recalculated or flipped. Very quickly, to recalculate normal directions, go into edit mode, press A to select the entire mesh, and then press shift in. This has recalculated the normal directions, but if we need them to instead be flipped, go to the operator box that opens in the bottom left and check the box inside. Now the normals have been flipped. Now back to sculpting. We peeked at the brush settings earlier. Here we just have a lot of different settings to adjust our brush. We see some of them have the pressure sensitivity option next to them. By the way, all of these same settings are also over here on the right in the tool properties panel, which might be a faster way to access them. Whichever way you wanna use them, they're in two locations. The texture settings allow us to brush with a texture, which is for a more advanced sculpting tutorial. Under the stroke settings are different options for what a stroke of the brush will do. The default here is dot, which functions pretty intuitively. I'll just demonstrate a couple other options here. The airbrush stroke gives us a slightly different effect that mimics an airbrush. The line stroke lets us touch or click and drag a line to sculpt. Then it applies the stroke in a straight line. With the anchored stroke, we click or touch and then drag to expand the range of the stroke. Then it's applied when we let go. So the important thing to know is there are different stroke settings here. Fall off has settings for how the brush's effect dissipates. We're going to skip this area for now. For cursor settings, we can adjust the look of the cursor. One helpful thing we could do here is assign a different color to display, depending on whether we are on the positive or inverted strength settings. That way, if we're switching back and forth, we don't accidentally sculpt in the wrong mode. Now, here are some pretty important settings. We can turn on mirroring along any or all of the axes while we sculpt in Blender. Often we want to sculpt an object symmetrically, like a human head and we want both sides of the head to be identical. Choose the axis to mirror. We can do some of the sculpting with the mirror turned on, and then we can turn it off to add details to just one side if we want. Another feature in this settings area is symmetrize. Let's say we had sculpted something on one side of an object, and then realized we wanted to make the opposite side look exactly like that side. We have to figure out which axis we need to use, and then whether we are going from the negative side of the axis to the positive side or vice versa, or we may just need to keep trying a few different options here until we figure it out. Then we click Symmetrize, and Blender makes the non-symmetrical object symmetrical across the chosen axis. It's pretty useful. Dyn Topo stands for Dynamic Topology. It is one of the few methods for dealing with the need for additional geometry to get the amount of detail we want when we're sculpting. There are a few other ways that I'm probably not going to get to in this video, but this one here is pretty handy. When we have a base object and we try to sculpt, we realize we may need more geometry to get the detailed sculpting that we want. We can only sculpt with whatever geometry we have on the mesh. So dynamic topology adds geometry as we sculpt. When it's turned on, Blender will create as much geometry as needed to get the details for our sculpture. The issue is it creates a pretty messy mesh with a lot more geometry in certain areas, and this is not ideal for a lot of things we might want to do later on. There are things we can do to clean this up and I do use Dyn Topo in Blender for a lot of sculpting. Just be aware of what it's doing. The next setting is Remesh, which is one potential solution to retopologize or fix a really messy mesh by completely rebuilding the geometry. This could be covered in more depth, but in short, as we sculpt, we can get some really messy geometry. Hit Remesh, adjust the settings to your needs, press Remesh. Now it's a lot cleaner. On these settings, the larger the voxel size, the larger and less dense the mesh will be afterwards. It will also be less detailed though. So that was just a quick overview of how to remesh in Blender. I said there are different ways to set up a base mesh. I don't want to overcomplicate this. There just needs to be a starting point. It can be a very rough starting point. Often we are modeling the basics of something in Blender and then adding detail to it with sculpting. For simplicity, I'm just going to jump into the brushes and show you how they work using a UV sphere. 
I'll give it a lot of subdivision so we have plenty to work with. In object mode, I'm going to set the object to shade smooth so we get a much smoother view of the sculpture. Now let's go into the sculpting workspace, which takes us into sculpt mode automatically. As I mentioned earlier, the default brush is the draw brush. As we sculpt with this set to positive, it adds geometry as if we were drawing on the sphere. As with most brushes, we can turn it to negative and it will draw shapes into the mesh. The next brush is draw sharp, which is pretty similar to the last one, only the new geometry will have a sharper shape. It'll kind of come to more of a peak, and here it is when it's set to negative. I'm not going to cover every single one of these, but the blue brushes all do things fairly similar to this, just slightly different for each one. Then you notice there are orange brushes. These brushes are more for smoothing out or correcting geometry in Blender, rather than adding geometry as we sculpt. The smooth brush smooths the sculpted surface. The flattened brush flattens it. The fill brush will try to fill in valleys in the sculpt without raising the overall height of the mesh too much. And there are a few more below that. Now we move into the yellow brushes. These tend to manipulate the mesh rather than adding or subtracting. The first one is the pinch brush. If we have a raised area or ridge, the pinch brush will pinch it together to make it a little bit sharper. With the grab brush, we click on an area and then we pull away to drag it out. I'll jump down to the snake hook. With this one, we pull the mesh out and then can pull it in a different direction. There are a few here that are either very, very simple or that I honestly don't understand or that may require an entire video all to themselves. But let's go down and take a look at Blender's cloth brush really fast. This thing is pretty awesome. It will treat the mesh like cloth and our strokes will like wrinkle the cloth. Imagine using this on sheets of a bed or for clothing. It is very useful. Now let's talk about masking. When we sculpt in Blender, there will be times when we only want to sculpt on certain parts of the mesh. So there are options to mask out or hide certain parts of the mesh altogether. There is a mask brush. If we select it, and I will turn the strength to full for this one, we can start to paint a dark area onto the mesh. The dark area will not be affected when we now go to sculpt. I'll grab another brush, and as I sculpt, it will only affect the white areas. Down below, there's also a box mask. With this, we click and drag a box, and it will add a mask in the shape of the rectangle that we draw. To remove a mask, we press Alt-M on the keyboard. I'll probably have to add that one to my list of shortcuts that you can find at brandonsdrawings.com. There is also a box hide tool. Drawing a box with this will hide whatever is in the box. We use Alt-H to unhide it. The box trim tool will not only hide, but completely remove the geometry in the box, leaving a clean and trimmed edge. Be careful though, this one is permanent. Let's say we have a mask applied. There are a couple random, but really cool things we can do here. For example, the mesh filter will apply a uniform effect to the mesh. We have several options to choose from over here in the tool panel. Then there's the cloth filter. Do this and it applies a cloth effect to the masked area or the unmasked area, depending on how you look at it. Again, there are a lot of cloth settings in the tool panel for this. There's way too much to cover on these in this video, but I'm trying to give an overview of everything we have here in the panel. There are plenty of tutorials on sculpting and character creation, including a great one on Udemy that I'll link to in the description. You may notice a few coloring tools like the paintbrush down here. Blender is transitioning its texture paint and vertex paint features into the sculpt mode workflow, and it will eventually be creating a single paint mode to keep all the workflows consistent. It's not there yet, but we can paint in sculpt mode right now. I've actually got an entire video on how to do that, so go check that one out if you want. It's up to you to get started playing around with Blender's sculpting tools and see what you can create. I hope this helped. Go to brandonsdrawings.com for a lot more resources on learning Blender. Hit subscribe to get more videos on this channel, and as always, stay creative.